hepatitis disease, the research shows that they're about one tenth normal production. So instead of getting maybe 20 or 30 fruit a year, you're getting maybe two or three fruit a year. And when the first time I started growing papayas in the 80s, I had no clue there was a disease out there. And I uh, knew my papayas. Now, most of them are grown from, you know, well, the vast majority of papayas are grown from seed. You just take the seed from the fruit at the supermarket. You can start them pretty easily. When they're about three or four feet tall, they should be blooming. If they're not, they probably have a disease. So when I grew them back in the 80s, first year, three foot of height, no flowers. Second year, they're about five foot tall, no flowers. Some of my friends from Hawaii were over and they said, plants are great, where's, where's the fruit? Uh, and then the, the third year, they were about this big and they had a few flowers and we got like two fruit that ripened the fourth year and we're going, and the fruit weren't very good. We're going, okay, this is a waste of time. Can't grow papayas here. Although I had friends growing papayas in different areas of Southern California, I was just thinking, well, of course, the other thing that happened was the late 80s when I was growing them were some of the coolest winters on record in Orange County and in Southern California in general. So that probably didn't help me. But the fact that we had virus restriction plants at that time, and when, when I look back at, okay, that's, that's what the virus does to them. Uh, and they said the virus has gone around the world. So on this virus, what happened, what was going on is that an area growing papayas was getting this virus. They would have to move their farm a few miles down the road and start up again. And they said, like they said in Hawaii back in the 80s, they were down to one last island that didn't have the disease. So the University of Hawaii, Cornell University got together to, they wanted to see if they can find a cure for this thing and you know they tried you know plants really don't have immune systems like people do like you can take a virus like the coronavirus kill it chop up little pieces stick it in your body and your body will think it's got the virus so it makes all these antibodies to fight it but this virus is dead so it can't affect you much uh but your body's you know already uh, alarm, so it's fighting this the dead virus, which won't affect it too much. So that's one way to become immune to something. You throw a virus in there, and your antibodies and your body itself reacts to it. Now plants supposedly can't do that. They tried it anyway, and they shot it in. You know, they shot the dead virus into the plants, and nothing worked uh, until they by they injected the dead virus into the nucleus of a cell. And then for some reason, that plant no longer got sick from that virus. Now, unfortunately, that's you technically, you know, realistically, it's they made the plant immune. Technically, they made it a GMO plant because there's a foreign gene in the nucleus of that plant. So uh, a lot of people in Hawaii got, got really angry at the farmers for growing these quote, GMO crops, and they're vandalizing the, the plantations. But the EPA says, this isn't really GMO. It's a lot, sick. you know, what was going on is if you eat a papaya with the virus in it, and I certainly did back in the 80s, I was eating those and they were lousy fruit. They said uh, in a non-protected papaya, you can get 70,000 copies of that virus in each cell in that fruit versus a few pieces of the virus in one of these genetically modified papayas. So they said, we don't care. This is a safe one because most people have eaten that virus already anyway, eaten those genetics. So, you know, it's still a controversy because they did that. But, you know, they, Cornell and the University of Hawaii aren't making a single penny off of this. They did this free for the farmers so that they can grow a papaya crop. Uh, so around the world, they're doing this around the world, different universities around the world, creating this line of virus-protected papayas. Now, this one uh, isn't a virus-protected papaya. It's probably why it's not producing quite as much as it could. But there's a lot of, quote, papayas that are tolerant of the disease. So they don't, so even though they get it, it doesn't affect their production that much. Like in the 
90s, I grew Merit alfalfa pies from uh, Cuba. Um, alfalfa pies originated in Mexico. So they're all medicine papayas, but around the world, they created different strains of it, like Hawaii's got their famous, smaller, sweeter papayas. But uh, the Meridol was uh, fairly immune or tolerant of this disease. So even though they had the disease, we were getting food on it, decent amount of food anyway. So that's the situation with the virus. It's a lot of the famous papayas that are being sold seeds and, and fruit are virus protected. So one of the ones that a lot of people ask for is red lady. But there's quite a few. Um, Rainbow is the one that they're growing in Hawaii, although for some reason they don't want to sell the seeds to the public. But if you buy a rainbow papaya seed in a uh, fruit in Hawaii and bring the seeds back, uh, half of those seeds should be virus protected. You know, they, that's not the original generation. So as the generations go on, then fewer of the seeds have that protection on them, but half will be protected, half won't. Uh, Red Lady, they're all, the seeds from fruit of that may not be protected, but they do sell the seeds for Red Lady that are protected. And for, there's one called Sun Gold, there's, uh, Quite a few virus protected ones. Most of the solo types, swine types, are not that you can get. So if you want, to, yeah, the only one we know of is the rainbow one of the Hawaiian type solo types. But a lot of the Hawaiian types are tolerant. They'll still make fruit even though their disease just not as good, not as good quality, uh, not as quickly because. If the plant is totally healthy, it won't have flowers by the time it's two or three foot tall. That's usually the first year they start. If they start blooming the first year, you know it's a good plant. Okay, the thing about papaya, since you're growing from seed, there's three or four different sexes you can end up with, which is really interesting. So, you know, I would say papayas are the original LGBT plants because they have all kinds of of uh of sexes so there's now what's interesting is that like if you get a hawaiian papaya seed most of them most of the seeds will sprout out and make hermaphrodite which has got both female and male parts on it the flowers are generally large flowers, and the buds usually have a shape like this. And this is a hermaphrodite flower. You can see the size of the flower. <clears throat> the female part is in the center. And if you look around the petals, you can see little male, male stamens at the base of, the, of this developing fruit in here. And so it's got both male and female parts in the flower. And of the Hawaiian ones, they said two thirds of the seeds grown from Hawaiian papayas are hermaphrodites. A lot of other ones, it's, it's lower than that, and some are, are not that at all. So that hermaphrodite is that, then if you get a pure female, there's a lot of pure females too. Like Hawaiian ones, two thirds hermaphrodites, one third female. And if you're really unlucky, you get a male plant. So the female flower buds are usually shorter and rounder, no male parts in them. Um, now on Hawaiian papayas, what's interesting is this shape of the flower also determines the shape of the fruit. So the fruit resulting from hermaphrodite flowers is that typical light bulb shape. The traditional Hawaiian solo type papaya. The ones from the female flowers look like little footballs. So the fruit turns out that shape. Now, if you only have a female plant, it'll still make fruit. No seeds. It'll be uh, the seed cavity inside of the empty, whereas the hermaphrodites make the seeds. But if they if they're pollinated either by hermaphrodite or by male, they'll be a little bit bigger fruit and they'll have the seeds. But if they're by themselves, 
They usually still make fruit, but the cavity and the seed cavity is empty inside and fruit's a little bit smaller. Yeah. Is production less as well in general? Well, uh, generally, yeah, the fruit's smaller, so you're not going to get as much. And they and, and they may not set quite as well also. So, But you don't know until your plants are like two foot tall, which, you know, right when you see the flowers. Now, again, if you're real lucky, you get a male. And so the, when these flowers form, you can see this, like the hermaphrodites, there's actually making three flowers in each leaf base. However, usually the two side buds fall off. Um, yeah, I can see on this developing one, there's three buds there, but this, on this one, the two side buds fell off before it opened up. On the true females, they'll have the three buds too. If you have a male plant, you'll get this long stem that shoots out and then branches and branches and branches over and over and over. So it comes out like 18 inches, even two foot long, and little tiny star-like flowers at the end of it. So that's the male plant. It gives you a little broom-like of, of little flowers that, that shoot out. So you know you're not going to get any fruit on that one. However, uh, uh, males tend to change sexes over time. And we had a male once, we grew a male Maridol papaya, and suddenly it started doing this. The very end flower was the female flower <laughs> on that branch. So we had papayas hanging on long branches. Usually they're right off the trunk, tight like this. And on that one, we had fruit hanging on long branches. That was real interesting. So they can change, so the male definitely can change sex. We've seen that. We've seen a few males that didn't. A lot of the males we grew changed sexes when they got older or had the addition of the female flower in there. So papayas heat temperatures below 55. Uh, so it really depends, your your success often depends on where you live. So if you're in Costa Mesa, certain areas of Fountain Valley, away from the big river beds, up on the hills in Orange, Tustin, you got a really good chance for Habra Forts and up in the hills there, especially at South Basin Hill that just stays warm in the winter. But you're down in South County or down low or by any river bed. Uh, uh, now we had a period of time, 20, 12 to 2016, we didn't have any winters. Just didn't have any winters, and everybody was going papaya those days. I mean, middle of Tustin, you know, everybody was doing well. But then 2018, we got some normal temperatures, and a lot of people lost theirs then. In the last few years, especially this last year, in my neighborhood, most papayas just died. It was just too cool in December. Uh, usually when they die, it's the roots that fail and the whole plant just tumbles out of the ground. You know, the trunk seems to be stronger than the root. Roots do not like cool, wet soil. Now, I have some customers who email me pictures of them hauling their pie in a container in and out of the garage at night. And I have a good friend that uh, would bring his papayas into his kitchen every winter. Uh, now, he's been divorced twice. <laughs> but uh you know that's what he did <laughs> he liked his fruit trees that's got priorities so anyway um that's the pies any questions on the pie trees yes. cold or wet Right. And then, like, are mulching No, mulching actually makes things. Well, in wintertime, sun heats up the ground. So, like in an orchard, if they want the orchard to be warmer, they clear off the mulch because that'll help the ground absorb the heat. Whereas mulches don't absorb much heat, they'll trap heat underneath the ground. But if the ground's cold anyway, then it doesn't let any heat through. So, they, they say bare, moist soil in the winter absorbs more heat. Now, what we did, the most successful papaya had pure volcanic rock so that they wouldn't get overly wet in the wintertime. So I just filled up a pot a little bigger than this, straight white volcanic rock, and do my papaya in that. 
and it lived for four years, made fruits. Uh, so papayas are very succulent. You know, their their stem is almost like cactus. So they don't use they don't seem to use a super heavy amount of water. So in pure pumice, you know, uh, they did quite well. I had you know out of pot in a 20 gallon pot the trunk on my papaya was that big and it was giving me some decent fruit so uh so we're, we're so that's one way is in the soil that prevents rot is pure rocks essentially that thing did die after its fifth year though it, it just rotted and fell over i mean those were the late 90s when we had really wet we had some really wet winters in the 90s 98 i think it's when it rotted and we had like 35 inches of rain <laughs> this didn't dry out and of course if it's warm the rain doesn't hurt them i mean if you're in hilo hawaii you get a couple hundred inches of rain a year and they're fine as long as it's warm when that's happening okay uh not many other you know they can get mildew so the oil sprays, uh, go weeds to get white flies, but that's gone away. Oh, and you can take branches. So if you find one, you know, the seeds, again, you never know what you're going to get from a seed. If you cut off, if you have one like this, we know it's a hermaphrodite, you can take one of these side branches and cut it off, and then you can root them and get them going that way. Uh, now, and most potting soils kill papayas, so you have to be careful. Our top pot potting tool, which is good for just about anything, we can grow papayas in without any worry about overwatering or not much worry. I mean, there's always still problems over on, but you can add a lot of pumice to that one too. But that's got a lot of pumice, perlite, sand, little peat, uh, little charcoal. So that and this is this is in our top pot. It's been in there. This is its third year now in, in the top pot. So no signs of rotting. You know, when it's real nice and stable like this, it's not rotting, but if they get wobbly, you know they're rotting. Mm -hmm. So I could take that say that side branch down at the bottom, just cut it near the the trunk. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, I haven't done it enough. I was told that you can do it. I would say if I was doing it, I'd put it in uh, so our acid mix, maybe even add a little more pumice to it. But our acid mix is sterile. Our top pot's not considered totally sterile. So for cutting, we like to go more sterile. So I'd probably take, you know, uh, or you can mix up your own mostly pumice, a little peat, and start it in that. So how often do you water? Well, when I had it in the pumice and in, uh, in the black plastic, I watered every day in the summertime because the pumice doesn't hold much water. Uh, in the ground, you don't have to water every day, but again, with production plants, so any farm you, know, you can think of will be watering at least once a day. They do not water like they did in the old days once a week. It, it's not efficient at all. So in the old days, because farmers didn't have the technology, all they could do is flood their fields once a week or once every 10 days. What happens with that is for three or four days of the week, it's too wet. And then for the rest of the week, it's too dry. And then it's too wet, it's too dry, it's too wet. They don't like, plants don't like that. They'd rather be very even. So most farms water at least once a day. And there are some farms that water many times in one day just to keep the moisture levels even as they can, not too wet, not too dry. Hmm. So uh, if you can keep it more even, the plants are a lot happier. Now in a container, you can't help it. Most containers, by the end of the day, they're dry. Then you water them, and they're wet. And then they, by the end of the day, they're dry again. So you go through that cycle. But then if you have them in the ground, it's better to keep them just evenly moist water frequently. Is that because the sun's hitting on the side and evaporating is just getting warmer and evaporating more? Well, no, I just said in a container, like if this was in the ground, the root system would be about six or eight foot across. It's got much more soil to pull the moisture out of, whereas in the pot, it's such a small area that it's drying that whole thing up. 
That's uh, it. But in the ground, yeah, it wouldn't, it would only use up a little bit of moisture at a time. So, got it. And the mm -hmm. the Okay, that's a good question. So in Hawaii, they're always planting new seeds, or in most tropical areas, they're always planting new seeds. So they usually have the trees for up to five years, and by that time, they're 20 foot tall in the tropics. So they just pull them out, plant a new crop. Now here, you may want to keep that tree if it's a good tree, and you can just cut the top off, and they'll start growing where you cut them again and start over. And a lot of people have shown me, well, we, the side branches are low enough, they just cut this off and keep the side branch and let that produce for, them for another five, six years or so, and then it gets too tall again. But, you know, in the tropics, where they are much easier to grow, you just keep planting new ones when they get too tall. Is that because it's hard to harvest, or is it the production drops? It's just too hard to harvest. I when see. they're 20 foot off the ground, yeah, no one wants to plant the ladders. And like any other plant, you have to rotate crops. So if you grow papaya in one spot for five years, you got to plant it a few feet away from that. So you have good results. So put new dirt in right where you plant it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We fertilize them, and you know you want to keep them constantly fed. So. Although, you know, in California, this area, the only time of year when they're really actively growing, like if you're in Hawaii or Mexico, southern Mexico, the temperature is always warm enough. But here, you know, they, they like it above 80 in the daytime, and that's usually May through October. So we only have like five months of growing period for bias. So like if you're, okay, that's a good point. So in Hawaii, the fruit ripens in six to eight months. Here, you get flowers one year, the fruit ripens the next year, because we just don't have the heat to ripen them over winter. So uh, uh, that fruit always has to hang on through the winter to get ripe the next year. So quality-wise, we're never going to be as good as Hawaii or, you know, the trop the true tropics. But, uh, you know, except for those, you know, if we get winters like we had 2015, I know winter, I mean, a friend of mine in Tustin, he, I went to his house, picked the fruit off his house, his tree in February. It was excellent. One to pie in February, but that's when we had no winter. So, okay, that's papaya. And right at the moment, our, our crop is very, very young. I would say leaving the pot till it's another foot, foot and a half tall. They'll go faster in the black plastic for a while, and don't buy the ones that look like they're virus, although it may be tolerant of them. It says it's a solo type. But um, the ones without the skinny leaves are the ones to look for. Okay. Those ginger beans. They're not called GGBs in their native countries. I can't remember what they call them. But GGBs um, are also known around here as Chinese dates. So you can see the shape of this little fruit growing right here. They're kind of shaped like a date and they get as big as most dates do. So we're talking fruit maybe an inch and a half about as thick as my thumb on this particular one. Now there's different shapes in jujubes. This one is one of our more popular ones. I call it GA866, I never got a formal name. Now jujubes are one of the most expensive plants to propagate and the reason for that is that most trees are propagated by bud grafts. So you, you grow your rootstock, from seed usually. And then when you want to graft it to the right plant, you can just take a bud out of the stem and insert that into the trunk of this rootstock, just one bud, and then that'll, that'll grow and make a tree. Jujubes don't really have buds like that. 
So they actually have to graft a branch onto the top of the rootstock. So at the base, this tree, you're up close, you can see this, but they grafted about a two, two and a half inch branch onto the top of this rootstock, and then it grew. A lot more work than grafting or inserting a bud into the side of the stem. The jujubes are kind of oddball guys. They don't have, they don't operate like regular plants do in many ways. So now the other thing about jujubes, a lot of books say it's they're self-fertile, especially older books. Now the modern books say partially self-fertile or not self-fertile. So it's nice to have two varieties. Uh, two different cultivar named cultivars are two different cultivar genetic types to, to get a good crop of fruit. So the first time I took a GB home, it was actually one of the G866, and all the books at that time said they were self fertile. So I planted my yard, grew about eight foot, it was making about 20 or 30 feet a year. I'm going, well, the little ones at our store make a lot more food than that. So I took home a, a Sherwood GB to put next to it. And then it started making 300 per year. So I know that it's not totally self-fertile. It needs help by a, a genetically different tree. Now, the reason why they probably didn't think that they needed pollinators is because of what's happening on this one. So this is a jujube here that's got a shoot growing from the rootstock. You can see it's blooming like crazy. This is genetically different than this. So this can pollinate this. So in an orchard of say one type of jujube, you'll get suckers. I mean, you'll get hundreds of suckers. You know, each tree that we've ever seen always suckers by its third year. And the suckers always bloom immediately. And they'll pollinate this plant. So you don't have to buy two different jujubes. You just let one sucker or now this sucker is trying to in the whole plant. So it's probably better to cut it down so that it stays smaller. And that still has plenty of flowers on it. Now this one already set a fruit here. And it's not blooming anymore. This one is blooming here. So the presence of this nearby will help these flowers make fruit. Gary, I'm sorry, can you go back to the, the, the um, grafting technique? Are you saying that's not a bud graft? Then? No, it's a, it's a branch graft. It's a, I don't know what you call it, cleft graft. Really? So they actually had to put a piece of stem on the top of that rootstock. And then this is a branch, a side branch of that, and then they lopped it off? Is that... And then this grew out the side of the side bud on this branch. Right? I see. I see. Yeah, jujubes are really uh, unusual tree. So one thing about the majority of fruit trees, woody fruit trees, like papaya is kind of an oddball. It's, it's a herbaceous plant. It's not a woody tree. But just about every woody fruiting tree you can think of bears fruit on second year wood. In other words, the branch that grows this year will have growth that comes off and makes fruit. So this branch that grows this year, whatever comes off of this can make fruit. Whatever comes off the older wood from two years ago will not have fruit on it. It's got to be coming off of last year's growth. Now this year, this is last year's growth. So whatever, all these branches supposedly could bloom and make fruit, this is just too young to do it, although some of them did do it. But then next year, whatever grows off of this branch or this branch or this branch with leaves on it right now can then make fruit. Jujubes don't work that way. So jujubes are one of the few fruit trees, you can cut them almost to the graft union and they'll still make a tree that makes fruit. Uh, we had read about how they use jujubes in Afghanistan, different species, but still does the same thing. So they said that their farmers use the whole tree. So here they have this tree that's about 10 by 10 in the summer, makes about, they said about 20 pounds of fruit. A week after they harvest the fruit, they strip all the leaves off and feed their cattle. Now, truthfully, jujubes here ripen in September, October, 
And a few weeks after that, the leaves start falling off. They go to sleep real here early after the crop's off. So the farmers really aren't doing too much damage to the tree by pulling the leaves off early because they're gonna fall off in a week or so anyway. But then in the winter time, they cut the tree down to a stump and use it and save the wood for firewood. And then the next year, the tree grows from that stump, makes fruit, does everything over again. So I had to try it. So my the jujube in my house was about 10 foot tall at that time. I cut it down to 18 inches just to see what it would do. And by July, it was up this high, full of flowers, making fruit again. So, uh, so jujube is one of the easiest trees to control size because you can cut it any height you want as long as you don't go below the graft and you'll get fruit the next year, a lot of fruit, not having to save much of the plant. So very interesting plant that they do that. Supposedly has some plants in the North America that are related to jujubes, but uh, as far as I know, they don't use them for food. So. Okay, so this tree here, now the original tree that was trees that were brought over from China back, I think around the 1900s or late 1800s, were Li and Lang. Li, we still sell today. I don't have any right now, but Li is a nice, fairly large jujube shaped about like that. Lang is more shaped like a date like this. Uh, Li can get up to egg chicken egg size in the right climate. Now jujubes, the climate they come from is very similar to Fresno or Las Vegas. They like it really hot. And as far as we know, jujubes no chill requirement. The book says they have a chill requirement of a couple hundred hours. We disagree totally with that because those years we had no winter, they woke up in January. They were, you know, most winters, most years, like this year, they would wake up. Well, we had a hot February. They would have woken up in March or April. But a lot of these years we have cool springs. They don't wake up till May. And we, in one year, this was 2008, they didn't wake up till June. They just stayed sleeping. It was so cool that they just didn't bother to wake up. So they respond to heat only. If it's warm, they're going. They're crop, and they, you know, we saw flowers in January back when we had no winters. They were blooming really early. So they don't need to chill. They just don't want it warm. Uh, Lang, we no longer sell because it doesn't ripen well off the tree, or if we have cool years, some cool summers, it's got no no flavor at all. Now, uh, jujubes. Uh, well, just you know, the suckers make little berries. So most jujubes in the wild make berries about as big as peas, maybe pea to bean size. They still taste good. Most of them are not as not as sweet, but they still they have a lot of vitamin C in them apparently. So the original use for them in China was medicine for the vitamin C. But nowadays, all the ones we have are much larger. The ones they've selected are much larger and much sweeter. Sugar content on these can break 20, 20% or 20 bricks. So, uh, you know, people keep asking, what's the sweetest one? Well, do you need it any sweeter? <laughs> I mean, it's like, I don't think, that, you know, once the, well, the ones that are super sweet, are they that good for you or just, uh, anyway. So the newer ones we have, now GA-866, I don't know if we'll ever give that a formal name, but that uh, Chico State University in Northern California, they do a lot of, of breeding of, of the jujubes, and this was the row number for this particular one. And it stuck for some reason, no one ever put a formal name on it, so it kind of stuck. But it is a large, elongated, Jujube. Now, most jujubes ripen late summer into mid fall. Some ripen later, like Sherwood ripen later, but we don't have a source for Sherwood anymore. 
So most of them might have been kind of like mid-September to mid-October over a pretty extended period of time. So G866, when it came out, was the sweetest one at Chico State. Honey jar has taste sweeter. We don't know if it is sweeter because we don't have a oh, sugar meters here. But the food is very small. It's the smallest of the GGB fruits. It's about as big as a big marble. So I don't know how much that's worth. Some people still buy them, but they're really small fruit. And then there's um, sugar cane. And again, I don't know how this compares to the 66 either. It's kind of a medium size, elongated one, about the shape of a kumquat. Then there's um, Chico or Chico State. Now, this one's a little different. This one's shaped like an apple. So it's a totally different shape than the of these. And then there's the final one we usually carry is shank. No, it's not a star. Then seed which is supposed to be the largest GGB, bigger than the original Lee. But we're not positive it's any different than the original Lee. Because we looked up where Li comes from, it comes from the Chinese province of Shaanxi. So is Shaanxi Li different than the original Li? We're not we're not sure. Now the disadvantage of UGB is that they do sucker like crazy. The reason most trees sucker, so a lot of times if you just plant uh jujube in the ground you leave it alone it's fine it doesn't sucker much but if you if you plant plants around and you cut through the roots every time you cut a root things sucker and grows a new tree and even sometimes they'll sucker without having cut the roots but if you cut a root they'll sucker and grow a new tree so a lot of people get mad and of course it's not like they make a hundred a year it's like they make three or four suckers or you just clip them off they're not impossible to deal with. And again, the trees can wake up late and go to sleep early. The trees do have an unusual shape to them. There's, I don't, I can't really get it lately, but there is one called contorted UGB. And UGBs all kind of do this anyway, but they have kind of a zigzaggy style of growth. And then the branches come back down kind of zigzaggy style of growth also. So they're not a bad looking tree at all. And again, you can keep many sides you want, just cut them to the height you want them to start growing at the next year. So attract trees, but they are dormant for using for a long period of time. Uh, average water needs, they're drought tolerant, but if you want fruit, give them uh, average or a good amount of water. They can handle water. At my house, it happened to be where my valves were to my sprinklers, and it was always wet there. There was always seemed to be in a puddle, and they were fine. They were fine with that. But the hotter the summer area you're in, usually the bigger and sweeter the fruit gets. Yes. If you if you use a grow light to keep them warm, would would that help them produce more? You don't know that it helps them produce more. Because uh, you're saying they like the heat. Right. You know, I'm just wondering if you have something that's constantly emitting some heat. Well, yeah, it's, uh, it's more sunlight, sun energy. Because if, if they may, you know, if they do better in Fresno than here. Fresno's colder in the winter and hotter in the summer, but certainly less cloudy days. So I don't know if uh, any kind of light can make up for an hour of sunlight that's really bright yeah i'm just so, i'm just yeah. curious but it would well i mean the other thing to do is because the the sunlight creates sugar you can spray your plant with sugar and get the same results plants absorb sugar through the leaves so if they're in a pot it's moving 
like close to the house at night. Yeah. Yeah. No, people well, yeah. yeah. I'm not sure if exactly the heat, just the, the bright sun. Can I ask you a question about the growing habit? I've, I've got two GGBs, and one of them is, you know, kind of crazy. I did the same thing. I, I heard your talk last year, shopping TV. It came back, and it's kind of crazy, right? It's got my vines everywhere. And then I have a second one that is just vertical. And what's going on with that? Is it is it just different variety ones? Ones the the vertical one is a sugar thing, um, and different varieties just grow in different habits. Or well, when you talk about habits, a lot of times it's due to the source of the grafting wood. So, and that's an unknown. So, like they say with citrus trees, when they've done tests with citrus grafting, if the bud wood came from the top of the citrus tree, the resulting growth tends to be more horizontal, more production, less growth. If you take a bud wood from the base of the same tree, of one of the lower branches, the new growth tends to shoot up like a juvenile. And we know sugar cane is a relatively new variety. So all its offspring may still be quite juvenile and go straight up. I see. Whereas, you know, like like Lee and Lang are hundreds of years old, so they may be more horizontal growing. But yeah, the other one is it's one of the Shensi Lee. Well, you know, right? But, so that was yeah, brought from old China too. Yeah. So yeah. And can you speak a little bit to the, the pruning of that? Because to to my understanding, based on what I've read totally different from normal pruning in that it's like one cut stops growth, two cuts uh, cause growth to, to uh, continue to sprout, right? Like is it a normal cut on a regular tree? Uh, I haven't heard any difference. So on fruit trees in general, if you cut a branch right in a straight area of the branch like this, it'll force the top three or four buds to open up and make a real bushy growth right there. If you cut this trunk right above this side branch, that side branch has got the power or got the control and nothing sprouts from this cut because this branch is already in control of this area of the tree. Whereas if you cut it, you know, in the middle of here above this branch, then this, then it can sprout out a lot of branches right at that cut because this is too, is below it, but the, the hormone is uh is it doesn't hormones come down the exactly. from the tips back yeah. So. But my yeah my understanding is that uh, uh, PGBs don't work that way based on what I read. So I don't know. I was just curious if you had any insight. But no, I've got no. another question mm -hmm. about the so um the uh the lead PGB that uh, it's my second year of having this tree. First year it produced probably maybe thirty three delicious really really good and this year after i locked it down it grew bigger and probably had i don't know almost 100 fruit on it but so it have a branch and that fruit 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 fruit, fruit. and then all of a sudden a lot of the fruit started to shrivel you know turn brown um not all of them and i was wondering do you know is that it just self-thinning do you need to thin QGB in general, or is there something else going on? No, Pretty no, hot where I am. No, no, I haven't grown enough QGB plants. I've only grown a few in my life, so I haven't seen that. I haven't noticed. You no, know, I just, a lot of things I don't notice. My, my, you know, most trees like avocados, they might set thousands of fruit and end up with a hundred. Right. So uh, I don't know. I mean, some fruit trees don't seem to drop anything at all, like apples and pears don't seem to drop. You got to thin them. But then when most fruits do drop, most of the fruits that they, they set. It does seem like an, an enormous amount of fruit. Like, how could it support all that? So maybe it's something. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay, so for Simmons. So... Sorry, last question on the to uh, be uh, fertilization. Uh, any recommendations? Well, on all these fruit trees, we just use the typical fruit tree fertilizer like down to earth is, is a good one. Uh, um, you can't say there's a better one than this. There's a lot of other ones like this. 
but this does have a lot of calcium in it too, which woody plants like uh, for food production and for production of branches. So, and some fertilizers leave the calcium out. So we do like this one because they do put a lot of calcium in there too. Um, but yeah, we don't treat jujubes, papayas, or persimmons any differently than other plants' fertilizer oils. I mean, we often start most of our plants at the nursery with osmocote, which is chemical, just because it starts working faster, but we always end up using an organic. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, persimmon trees. The persimmons have become more and more popular over the last few years. I mean, uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have a very good supply of persimmon trees at the moment. So 10 years ago, we had three growers who supplied us with persimmon trees. Uh, um, now we're, with, we're left with one. So a lot of those nurses, well, one went out of business, it was a family problem. <laughs> So, and then the other one out of business because of the economy, they were hanging on to 2008, 2010, they decided, but now they're coming back. So I said, by end of next year, I can have some persimmons from them, but they're growing them differently now. So in fact, within a few years, we think the entire industry will be changed. So up until now, most of the trees have been grown in the ground on a farm, you know, in this central valley. And then they're dug up and sent to us as bare root trees. But more and more, the farms are changed to container grown food trees in skinny tall pots. And uh, that's the future of uh, food tree production because with bare roots, it is a mess for them to, to have to harvest everything in about two or three week period in December and send it out within a two month period in January, February, all across the United States. Rather than if you have them in pots, you can pretty much send them anytime you want through the mail. Uh, the bare root food trees tend to be about 10 foot long when we get them, so they need to go in the back of a big rig. Just more painful to do it that way than have them in the box and you can send them in the mail a lot better. So most of the food tree companies are going that way now, or the nurseries are going that direction. So in a few years, and they won't be that much different than these, because these, when we got, so uh, in January, we get, oh, when we ask the growers to grow the bare root trees for us, most of the persimmons that we want to get are about as thick as my finger, so they call that about a half inch caliper, five eighths caliper, and the trees are about this big when we get them, and they're most of them are capable of making a few fruit that first year. And now this company is, you know, with one company left, we're only allotted maybe 30 trees. So we tell our customers, okay, call us up in October, we start taking pre-orders in October, pay for them, we'll put your name on, them as they come off the truck. And if you are if you buy early enough, you'll get one of the 20 or 30 were allotted. Uh, and then after that, it's, you know, it's a free for all after that, because we only allotted 30 of the nice ones. And then usually the grower has a lot of ones that are, you know, this was pencil thick essentially, instead of finger thick, pencil thick. Uh, some come as short as two foot tall when we get them. And those, uh, a lot of those just fail to grow at all that year. Persimmons are not, persimmons and jujubes both are not the best trees to grow as bare root. Like stone fruit trees, apple trees, pear trees, we're really, it's really unusual for us to lose one tree of those. Like this year we lost uh, maybe one stone fruit out of 500 trees. Whereas persimmons and jujubes, we're always losing, you know, one out of every 10, say, just don't make it. So they're more difficult uh, to get good quality plants out of. Jujubes is because the roots are so skinny. You pull them out, you pull them out of the ground, you might break all the roots off of these trees. And the ones we get, you know, sometimes they're, you know, as thick as a toothpick, but they're like five foot long. 
So that's that's the roots of those. And then uh, persimmons, the roots are very brittle. Like apple roots look are, are like rubber. They rarely break, but persimmon roots are, are really brittle. So if they're not careful plowing these out of the ground, they can break all the roots off. So there's a lot of calls on UGBs and, and persimmon trees. So this one we know is in good health just because, you know, when we first, when you first get a, a bare root persimmon, they have enough energy to make these little tiny leaves. All these little tiny leaves on here, that first flush of growth. But they can do that without a good root system. So we know, you know, if you just see small leaves on the tree, we go, okay, that, that hasn't proven to us that it's growing any roots yet. Once they do this with mature size leaves, you know, okay, that tree is growing good roots. It's got good roots. This one appears to be okay too. Because it's got new growth coming out in summer. So a lot of times if they don't have good roots, they put out a few leaves in spring and that's it. They just sit there the rest of the year, no new growth. We're okay, we just hesitate to sell those if we know it may die this next winter because it's not it doesn't have any new growth. But once they have this new growth coming, it's got new growth here. I see a new sprout coming here. Then you know, yeah, this has probably got a good root system on it too. I mean, last week we had a whole bunch more persimmons. We sold so many persimmons this week. I thought this class is going to be not have anything at all to show you. But these are the largest three left that I, the largest couple left that we had. And this one certainly looks good. Now there's two classes of fruit on persimmons. Uh, So there's types that are not astringent and types that are astringent. Most people prefer the ones that are not astringent, so you can eat them even when they're crispy, hard, and they're and they're not going to react with your mouth. So when they're astringent, I mean, persimmon could be look ripe, uh, be juicy looking, and then you put it in your mouth, and your mouth feels like you just threw a handful of flour or dry flour on there. It totally dries out your mouth. That's astringent. When it's astringent, you can't swallow, you can't do anything, you can't talk. It is a really interesting effect on your on your on your mouth and tongue and everything when it's not totally right. So now the shape of the fruit doesn't determine that, but most of the non astringent ones are shaped like tomatoes. And most of the astringent ones are shaped like wood tops or like this shape. And here's some branches off of the persimmon trees. This, at this time of year, they look like this. So, this is the Puyu non astringent type, shaped like a tomato. And this is the hot chia, which is one of the astringent type shaped like a wood top. These can get really big. I mean, we're talking three or four inches in size. Really big fruit. It's impressive how much fruit persimmon trees can make when they're mature. The bad thing about persimmons when they're when they're young, or if they're not healthy, they abort all their fruit. And some varieties are real bad at that. They make, you know, they make fruit and it gets about this big and then it just falls off. And it just drives you nuts when they do that. Uh, I had a persimmon tree, and we'll talk about the different varieties called Gosho, which was a giant, they call it giant fuyu. And around August, all the fruit were about that big, and it would abort all of them. It's like, man, this thing's driving me nuts. After three years of doing that, I just cut the tree down. I couldn't stand watching that anymore. The aborting fruit that was already. You know, I'm all, uh, you know, like six or seven ounces in size and would abort them at that size. They were supposed to grow about this big, but they were aborting them at three or four ounces and it just drove me crazy. Um, anyway, so the, so the astringent, non astringent, so the astringent ones, you have to wait till they're about the consistency of jelly. And then the astringency is gone. 
you can eat them when they're slightly astringent, but generally when you touch the food, it's soft all over. If it's firm anywhere, that's still astringent. You gotta wait till it's, now it still has texture. So it's not like jelly jelly. It still has texture and still, if you cut it, it comes out in sections. But the, each section is very soft, but it holds together okay in your mouth. And you can chew it and then swallow it. Very, very sweet, has a slight uh, cinnamon flavor to them. And that reminds me a little bit of pumpkin flavor. But, you know, for that time of year or for fall when they ripen, quite appropriate. And then the non astringent ones you can eat while they're so hard, but be aware that there are some for some shape this way that are astringent until they're dead ripe. So not all the shape doesn't have everything to do with it. So the famous names that we sell, Hachia, is the main one people were knew about. I mean, they said uh, in the 1940s, when farmers in the Central Valley got a hold of their first Hachia, they went crazy over how sweet the fruit was. So they planted like 4,000 acres of Hachias and then no one would buy them. <laughs> so they, they pulled all, most of them out and they found out, oh, it's the Puyus that, that people from Japan really like or from people from Asia really like. So Puyu is the original non-astringent persimmon. Now this is the original Puyu. It's no longer being sold because the original Puyu that I grew up with in the 1950s and 60s has seeds. The newer types we're selling do not have seeds. And truthfully, the newer types we're selling taste sweeter. So the original Fuyu, slightly more rounded than the newer. So the newer Fuyus are very flat. The original Fuyu is shaped a little bit rounded, more like that. But when this is fully mature, it's now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's not quite as flat as the newer ones, but it does have seeds, a few seeds in each fruit, not many. The seeds are wedge-shaped in uh, percentage, and usually each of these will have like two seeds, three seeds in it. But I remember when I was a kid, they had seeds, and suddenly in the 70s, they had no seeds. So um, the one, the main one they're selling now as a Fuyu is called Jiro. And it is definitely flat and seedless. Usually ripens October. And then another one that we sell is Emoto. Ripens in September. Late September until October. I grew both of these for a while, and my dad and I would always have a taste test when the fruit was ripe. We always liked Emoto better, and then we found out what Emoto is. Emoto is just a sport of Jiro that ripens two weeks earlier. So when you have one that's two weeks riper than the other, it tastes better. We thought, oh, the texture on Emoto is better and, and the taste is better. Well, it's only because it's two weeks riper than Jiro. So, but that gives you a head start if you want to have, you like, if you love persimmons, Emoto in September, Jiro mostly in October. That is a nice way to go on them. Now for years, the people from the university uh, extension office would tell us, these are drafted on the wrong root stock. You're selling uh, Puyus on the wrong root stock. And they would, every time I'd see them and at meetings we'd go to, they'd say, you're selling persimmons on the wrong root stock. It, they won't, that's incompatible. Well, no, they were, they were just, you know, some, sometimes the little information is the wrong information. It's the original Fuyu that was incompatible with the Lotus rootstock. These are not close related to the original Fuyu. They look like Fuyus. They're better than Fuyus, but they're not incompatible with the rootstock we were using. And uh, one of our suppliers kept sending us letters saying, don't listen to the university. They keep giving them the wrong information out of them on these rootstock and compatibilities. It's the original Fuyu, not the newer types of Fuyu 
that are incompatible with that lotus root stock. The, the the proof is in the pudding, right? So it, you've seen the the ones that are in the lotus root stock. These two do perfectly fine. Yeah. Like that. Well, what they mean by incompatible is it works for a while, and then after a few years, it it dies off or breaks off or something. Right. Have you seen Have you seen any no issues, right? Mm -hmm. At least not with the fluid types. So, and then there's another one similar to these called Easy. This, you know, when I first grew Easy, they said it was earlier than the other Fuyus. And I grew my Easy when the fruit started to color up in July or not that's early, but it's it's more or less August. August into September, in most September and October, zero to October to November. So they have a long harvest period. But the Izu is really early. It's a little bit smaller, not quite as wide fruit as the other two. Some books say okay, this is the best tasting of the Fuyu types. There's no way to compare it. Right way before anything else does. It's good. The tree is, I would say, the weaker and smaller. The book says smaller. I'd say both weaker and smaller than the other ones. Uh, Jiro seems to be the serious of these three. So Jiro is the one to get first. And if you want them earlier, then get Emoto, get Isu. We order all of them every year. So most years we don't get all three. This is uh, Jiro here. That's a hot sheet of work. So there's some other persimmons out there too, the chocolate. Which is kind of a long shaped persimmon. And it has flesh that turns kind of brownish when it's as it ripens. And it actually has a slight, you know, slight chocolate flavor to it. So it's quite good too. I still like the original Fuyu's better, but I have some customers that brought me in chocolate, the fruit off mature chocolate for some, and they were rather good. And then there's the coffee cake. Uh, and the pan is called, I think it's loose chain. The problem with coffee cake, well, the, the, the nice thing about coffee cake is it's got both orange and brown flesh in it. It's kind of swirled, so like coffee cake is. So it's got interesting uh, combination of flavors. However, it's got to be next to a chocolate persimmon. If you don't have the chocolate persimmon tree, do not buy coffee cake. Coffee cake will produce fruit without chocolate around, but when it's seedless, it's inedible. You cannot eat that fruit. So I, I had one of these Nishimura wasses thinking my other three persimmons, my heart would pollinate, but I didn't have a chocolate. And the other persimmon trees like Jiro and Emoto are, are really good about not making male flowers. They don't make any male flowers. Chocolate makes hordes of male flowers. So my coffee cake, make 200 fruit a year, beautiful, big orange fruit. Never ripen. You take them off the tree, store them for a month. They're still rubber. Do all the tricks you can think of to make it ripen. It just won't ripen. So totally worthless without the chocolate around it. Uh, now, hachia. Some people like the hachias, and in Japan there are traditional ways to ripen this quickly. So. Now, in, in the United States, they have an American persimmon down in the deep south, and they know <laughs> if there's two frosty nights, the fruit is edible because the freezing essentially explodes the cells within the fruit and makes the astringency go away. So you put a hot chia, fully ripe hot chia, but it's still firm in your freezer, and then you take it out of the freezer, Put it back in the freezer a day later, take it out. It is totally ripe and jelly like. Traditionally, in Japan, what they would do is throw them in a empty sake cake, and the alcohol would do it overnight. 
So a friend of mine said, oh, you don't need the keg. And we just take a Ziploc bag, throw as good as hot chia, put in there, put a few drops of the alcohol, you know, sake is traditional, in the, in the bag with it and close up the bag. And he says, by the next morning, the food is, is, is totally non astringent. So that's the traditional way of doing it, either by freezing or by alcohol. I guess both things will explode the cells, release the astringency. Persimmons are grow at a moderate rate till they start production. Once they start fruiting, they can really overproduce to the point of where they just destroy themselves. I mean, I the first persimmon I grew at my house uh, back in the 80s, it was about this big. It had two fruit the first year. And the next year it had 25, grew maybe a couple inches. And the year after that it had 75. And it went into so the tree, I had the tree for like 10 years. It never was any taller than this. Hmm. It was just loaded. The branches were just laying on the dirt. My other persimmon, that was an emoto. My juro next to it did fruit for four years. But in the meantime, it grew about eight foot tall and eight foot wide. And in its first crop, it had maybe 200 fruit. So it saved its energy and grew instead. And then uh, produced later. Now, Emoto being a sport off of Giro, because of that fact, it'll be a little more precocious than Giro. So the sport off of the original is more precocious. So any baby made by Emoto is going to be more precocious than Emoto and produce younger. Hmm. So we we do notice that Emotos tend to produce younger than Giro. It's not always the case because again. Depends on where on the tree they took the budwood off. Took the budwood off the top, it acts more mature. Take the budwood off the bottom, the tree acts more juvenile. So there's other factors involved too. But in general, uh, Emoto seems to be more precocious than zero. I don't know the history on easy where it was found. Another person we often have is Saijo. And Saijo is considered to be the sweetest persimmons, but like most sweet things, it's also the smallest. So they tend to be about that big. And they're astringent, but they are really sweet. Now, if you really like persimmons, at the field station in Irvine, they have a persimmon grove. And usually it's the first weekend, of first Saturday of December. They, you know, that no one over there really eats them much. So the, all the trees still have food on them, even the ones that ripen in September are still on the tree. And they just open up to the public usually, uh, not during COVID, they didn't, but usually. And then people go in there and just strip the trees. I highly trees. recommend, yeah, it's really good last year. Now, if you haven't had the, the opportunity, one of the, Best tasting foods in the world are dried hot cheetos. At the Asian stores, it's, I think it's Fujigaki, it's the, what they call it. But they take the hot chia persimmon when it's ripe, you know, it's attached to the stem like this, so they cut off that part of the whole stem with the food attached. They tie a little string around here and pull and so they just tie them up they take a um, peeler and peel all the skin off it's still pretty firm but it is orange at that time and just hang them up on the side of a big barn on the i, I don't know if it's the sunny side or not but whenever i see it, it's the side of a big barn or just hang them in space I, i've seen a picture of some people doing it underneath the big tree is hanging from the branches on a big tree. So they hang these things. And once a week or, or more often, what happens as these dry out, the sugar kind of accumulates on the surface, but they start hardening up. So they go through there and they massage the fruit every week as it's drying. You keep them real pliable, kind of the texture of rubber. And then when they're pretty much dry, they're kind of a nice brown color. And you know, that is one of the best tasting fruits you can ever buy. So they do sell them on the internet or you know by mail. You can buy it or you go down to some of the uh, Asian food stores, I think 
99 Ranch Mark carries them usually in winter or spring. And that's one of the tastiest things you'll ever eat <laughs> in your life. I mean, they sell them for like $10, $12 a pound, but it's a lot of work. But boy, often, you know, I have a friend who has one hot chia for some tree in her backyard. And she'll bring us two or three market bags full of those things every year. Because the thing makes just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of fruits. Incredible production on the hot chia persimmons. Most people don't know what to do with all of them. <laughs> you can get those, the, the, the dried uh, persimmons at the uh, uh, Orange Circle um, Farmer's Market Saturday mornings. There's a stall that sells them in there. Just in there yeah. Probably not good for your health, but really good. <laughs> as good as any dessert in there. Can I ask you a quick question? I've got a, 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 a Jiro, Jiro Fuyu, and it's second year, first year didn't produce, second year, it actually probably has a dozen maybe, but it's so small. It's, well, it's maybe this tall. Would you recommend me stripping the fruit off to encourage it to grow, or is it just going to do what it's going to do? Well, um, the fruit itself only influences the branch around it. So if you, you know, if you say take the top branch of tree and strip the fruit off of that, it has more energy to grow. Oh. It's kind of late in the year. You know, they only have, well, it's it already kind of big. They, well, they already have uh, two months of growing season left. So I don't know if you strip it off now, if that thing will start growing again. Because it's late in their growing season. But uh, yeah, if you let this branch produce fruit, it won't affect what this branch does. Okay. So you can just kind of choose the branches in. The other thing you do is you can spray the thing with sugar every week or even more often to compensate for all the sugar going to the fruit. I've never heard of this. This is the second time you mentioned it today. Can you go into that a little bit more? Yeah, it's interesting. Let me, let me grab the products that we use. So new to me. Yeah, if you, if you spray sugar water on an avocado tree, it loves it. Mm -hmm. it it's it all your feeds and it really, really likes it. So we um, read an article back in the 1980s saying that in Paul's Verdes, they couldn't get any, they couldn't get their citrus trees to fruit because it was too cloudy there, not enough energy going into the leaves. So people in Paul and Verne's uh, saw this formula in this research article from back east for this company or the university trying to, you know, they're doing hardwood cuttings of trees with leaves on them and they couldn't quite get them to finish the rooting because they said the carbohydrate content of the stem dropped too low. They couldn't finish the rooting. So they figured out a formula they can spray on the leaves to get more carbohydrates into the stem to finish the rooting. So these people in Paul's Murray saw that and they made up that same formula and sprayed the leaves on their citrus and got them to bloom and fruit. Um, so we saw that in the 1980s. We did a, our, our, our best test. We had a plum tree about 15 foot by 15, uh, 15 foot wide, maybe 10 foot tall plum tree that was making roughly five plums per branch on the tree per year. So he said, okay, let's spray one branch with the sugar in the fall when it's, when it's, at that time, the trees are storing energy for next year's crop and see what we can get on that one branch. Well, we got 28 plums on that one branch. We're going, okay. From five to 28, that seems to make a difference on that branch. Uh, and we just sprayed it every other week, like the books recommended during the fall months. And, and, and so every time we sprayed anything afterwards, we always, the molasses was the sugar they recommended. Now we've used carol syrup, we've used table sugar. Uh, I don't think it matters which sugar you use, but molasses was the original formula. And it was one ounce in a gallon. And the original formula also had one ounce of seaweed, one ounce of fish. So what all these do, sugar is what the leaves are making. That's the main thing they're making to power the plant. The cellulose in a plant is just a sugar molecule. So more sugar, more growth, 
more energy to assimilate everything, more energy to make fruit, the sweeter the fruit gets. Uh, seaweed is a growth hormone. So if you want something to grow, seaweed's the kick in the rear, gets you going. And then the fish is the mineral nutrients that they use to make the membranes of a plant. So the cell walls of the plant are cellulose and sugar. The membranes are all nitrogen or other minerals from fertilizer. Uh, so this way you have everything included, but the sugar is the star of the show. You get the sugar in the plant, it's like you're cheating. The plant's getting more, essentially more sunlight than it's actually getting. Mm. It's making more sugar. And we heard that this recipe is what the giant pumpkin growers use. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it's cheating, but no one can tell. So they said, yeah, if you don't do this, you can't break 500 pounds. So they get their pumpkins up to close to 2,000 pounds by, you know, wow. by giving them extra energy that way. And no one can tell they're cheating. But, you know, everyone does it now, so... So whenever we spray anything in the nursery, we're always putting the sugar on it, at least the sugar, because that we know that makes the plant stronger. But what happens, you get these huge leaves on things. I mean, we, we sprayed an orange tree once, and leaves are like that big. We're like, God, <laughs> that plant is really racking. That's the seaweed doing the making the size of the leaves. But, you know, we spray these persimmons that way, too. You can see the, how big the leaves are on this to get them going. So you want anything to grow at maximum size, maximum rate, and be more productive than normal, you spray sugar on it, and you can do it as often as you want. They always say spray it in the morning or evening when it's more humid. The longer the stays liquid, the less gets into the plant. But even if sugar hits the ground, sugar in the ground creates nitrogen because there's a lot of bacteria in the ground that depend on sugar supply to uh, then nitrify, you know, create nitrogen from the atmosphere. So... They found a long time ago, yeah, you spray sugar in the ground, things green up. Hmm. Um, but I met someone from the Philippines says, yeah, we've been spraying sugar on, cane sugar on our mango trees forever to make the fruit sweeter. So we've heard that. So people know about that. So it does, you know, it is, does work. Plant, you know, we're, we're just astounded that leaves can absorb sugar. Mm -hmm. But then they, they can absorb a lot of things, so. It's interesting. interesting. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Um, persimmons, not many pests. Ants and scale are their main thing. You have to keep the ants off the tree. Disease wise, haven't seen anything. Now, persimmons tend to alternate bear, which means now hachias may not, because we see a huge crop on them every year, but the Uyus tend to overproduce one year and don't produce an X and overproduce one year. So the way they handle that, like a, there's a, I think it's still, a portion of it still exists in San Juan Capistrano, the Bathgate Orchard of persimmon trees along the riverbed there. Uh, they figured out a long time ago, or in their own orchard, when the trees have a real heavy crop in the fall, they won't prune them at all. Because they said, yeah, this tree is so exhausted this year, you'll be lucky if you get a prune next year. But if they have a tree that doesn't prune one year, they know the next year's just going to be overloaded. So what they do is they say they cut back two thirds of all that of the current growth. So that instead of making, say, if the current growth is this long, instead of making, say, five or six persimmons on that, they'll cut it down to one or two persimmons on that branch. So it doesn't, so they can even out the production on it. So, but I don't know. Most people won't bother. They'll take the heavy crop. <laughs> they can get it. They're so good, and they also seem to need less water than other fruit trees. Um, I haven't seen anything written about that, but even in the containers, they don't seem to dry out as fast as other fruit trees do. And at my house, uh, we never did water them quite as much. I, I had friends when I was growing up that said, "Oh, we never water a persimmon tree. It seems to get by on on what it can get." So. I'm sorry, you may have covered this, but are they self-fertile? The, the, um, All are... except for the coffee cake. Well, like, coffee cake is self-fertile, too. It just won't be taste good. Right. So they don't need a pollinator except, you know, the chocolate and coffee cake have to make seeds. Co chocolate has its own male and female flowers. Coffee cake needs the chocolate. Yeah. Otherwise, they're all 
They call it parthenocarpic. They make fruit without being pollinated. Um, so they can go on the top. Because they're not they can. Um, we had a persimmon tree, this was about 15 years ago, in a 24 inch box. It had 70 fruit on it. We thought, God, the fruit on here is worth as much as the tree is. <laughs> <laughs> so we yeah, were probably made second year of that tree's life. It had 70 fruits in a 24 inch box. That was year two? Yes. Well, from that company, that was Ellie Cook before they went into business. They sent us persimmons inch in caliper, over an inch in caliper. So we had to put them in a 24 inch box, but uh, and occasionally we'll get them, you know, some that big. Hopefully in the future we'll get some that big, or, or we just have to keep them another year. Can I ask you about that? Yeah, we, it turns off. So we're thank you. <laughs> we'll turn this off and.